The Origin of Life. Xiefeng. August 16, 2005. Translated by Transin. Definition of Life. Before we can discuss the origin of life, we must understand first what it is, or we will not be able to explore its origin. Today, although the scientists who are discussing life may not be as plentiful as the hairs on an ox, at least their number is very large. When we enter words such as life, life study, origin of life, and life exploration into any search engine, we will find a wide field of life exploration articles from which we can gain an idea of the various research theories and achievements discussed by life scientists. Unfortunately, all life scientists just make fusses over their interpretations of it because none of them understand its real essence. Only Christopher Langton, an artificial life theorist at the United States Los Amos National Laboratory, in his publication, Artificial Life, initiated some introductory wisdom about the life exploration area. Some of his opinions broke through the limitations of traditional thinking patterns and took a small step toward understanding the cognition of life. For example, the essence of life lies not in its substance, but in its form. Then what on earth is life? Life is a non-material structure with spirituality. All substances are not life, but they can be carriers of life. As with a person's watch, car, house, and clothes, None of these are part of the person, but appendages and adornments of their life, and we cannot learn about them by simply relying on their appendages and adornments, nor can we know them by their age, appearance, height, weight, or other characteristics because all of these just show the material structure of their life carrier. It is very hard to understand non-material structures because they depend on our spiritual perceptions completely. They require extraordinarily sensitive spiritual perception to be seen. If one's spiritual perception is dull, it would be imperceptible in any way. But this does not mean that there is no way to understand it. I will give an example and hope it will inspire you to draw an analogy. As I send a fax from Harare, Zimbabwe, to my friend in Washington, D.C., his fax machine receives it almost immediately. The contents that he receives are nearly identical to what I had sent. My handwriting, the shape of the characters and the line spacing are unaltered by his fax machine. However, the original copy is still with me and I can toss it into a waste paper basket as rubbish because it has accomplished its mission and has conveyed its message, soul, to my friend in America. Let us analyze what has happened. The origin copy never left my room but my friend received the fax instantly and only the paper and ink, the carrier of the information, has changed. How do you explain this? The fax machine used the photoelectric principle to transfer the information into audio signals and sent them through an electric cable to a communication central office which transmitted them to a satellite uplink transmitter. A satellite received and retransmitted them. Then the information was received by a satellite downlink receiver sent to another central office and finally sent it through another electric cable to my friend's fax machine which restored the information from audio, signals into words and images. In this way, the soul of my original copy was sent to my friend. Here, we mainly focused on the audio signals, which are a kind of materials rather than non-material. However, they have their own characteristic structures which differ from other audio signals, such as their frequency, wavelength. If the structure has consciousness, then it will be a non-material one. When microscopic particle tends to be infinitesimal, it will not exist or move in the form of particles and it will become a string, or even a superstring. Superstring is a non-material structure. In this sense, the essence of life lies in non-material structures, rather than the carriers of LIFE material. The essence of life is formless. Who can tell the form, color, or weight of life? When referring to humans, dogs, vegetation, insects, and bacteria as life, we are literally talking about the expressions of their life forms rather than their essences of life. The forms of life are exceedingly strange and various, but the essence of life is unitary. Life has spirituality. Life cannot exist without it. Living people can walk, talk, breathe, eat, drink, and blink their eyes, but only until they die and their bodies lose their spirituality. Can we call a cadaver with no spirituality a human? Of course not. 
Thus, flesh is life when it has spirituality, but it is just a cadaver after it loses it. A stone can be called a life when it has spirituality, but it is only an aggregate of material elements after it loses it. A tree can be called a life when it has spirituality, but it is only a piece of wood after it loses it. A car can be called a life when it has spirituality, but it is only a heap of waste iron after it loses it. A statue can be called a life when it has spirituality, but it is only a heap of dried mud, plaster, or metal after it loses it. Any material object might be a life, or may only be an aggregate of material elements, depending on whether it has spirituality at the particular temporal time and space. Life is a non-material structure rather than a material one. Every material has a structure, even if it is only a molecule, an atom, a particle, or a string. As long as it is material, it will have a structure or particulate sequence, however the structure of a material does not imply that it has life. A cup may have a structure, but it is not a life unless it has spirituality. What are non-material structures? I ranked the non-material briefly when I talked about the negative universe in describing the universe. They include time, space, thinking, consciousness, mind, spirit, beliefs, order, spell, dharma, and soul. These are all non-material. Do non-material entities have structures? Yes, they do. Spells used in witchcraft are structures. Prayers in Christianity and Islam are structures. Lections read by Buddhists from their hearts and mouths have structures. Everybody's thinking are structures. The order of the universe, the law of physical movements, and progressive developments through time are structures too. All non-material forms have their own given structures, but this does not mean that all non-materials are lives. Only when the non-material structure has spirituality, is it a life. Is a vegetative person a life or not? No. They are not a life until the non-material structure with spirituality returns to their flesh. Is a person who is sleeping and dreaming a life or not? No, they are not a life until their consciousness returns to their flesh. It may be hard to accept this. Obviously, the people are still breathing. Their hearts are still beating. Their bodies are still warm. How can you say that they are not lives? Indeed, that is exactly what I am saying. If a car's engine is working with its headlights shining, maintaining a normal temperature, water circulating, and fuel burning, can we then say that the car is a life? If a pot of water is boiling on the stove with steam and with the possibility of scalding people, can we say that the pot of water is a life? We see people talk, run, eat, drink, and play in movies or on television. Are they lives? A great river is flowing, running, and crying. Is it a life? The moon moves around the earth at full speed and moves the earth's ocean tides. But is the moon a life? Everything in the universe may or may not be a life. Whether it is or not depends on whether it has non-material structure with spirituality at that moment. We just talked about the essence of life which is the same as the software in a computer. A software program can only perform its function when it enters into a computer's hardware, otherwise its program will not work. It is very hard to understand the essence of life. It sounds as if I am talking about something that is only in my imagination. So let me level down the meaning of life to a lower degree and analyze and interpret it from this presentation of life. Sakyamuni who possessed Buddha eyes defined life as born from eggs, wombs, humidity, or by transformation, with or without form, either thoughtful or thoughtless, and neither thoughtful nor thoughtless and this definition includes all life forms in the universe. The life forms born from eggs, wombs, and humidity can be seen everywhere on the earth, and they are easy to understand. What is life born by transformation? Every life with water, appropriate temperature, humidity, and that is formed naturally, belongs to the category of transformation. The huge numbers of microorganisms and various bacteria are all transformations. The life that can be seen through human eyes refers to the life which has physical forms. Every life that we see in the world is the life that can be seen through human eyes. What life cannot be seen by human eyes? This refers to the life which exists without any physical form such as the life in heaven, life in the Elysium world, life in netherworld, life in the frozen and inflamed layers, and so forth. Thoughtful life refers to life with self-consciousness. 
Thoughtless life refers to life without self-consciousness, such as plants without flowers or fruits, and nearly all gemstones. Either thoughtful or thoughtless life refers to life that appear to lack consciousness, such as the earth, the sea, thunder, wind, clouds, rain, snow, and so on but actually can have great wisdom. Neither thoughtful nor thoughtless life is superior. That which normal lives regard as a thousand years is only a moment to super-celestial beings and Buddha in supreme life space. There is, however, one superior life which exists on a holographic level only and has no physical form. This is the unique, greatest creator. It would take hundreds of years to comprehensively analyze all the life forms, but I will use humans as an example for which to interpret life. Life is one plus one is equal to one. Life consists of two parts, a formless spiritual entity and a tangible object. The formless spiritual entity refers mainly to consciousness, thinking, spirit, inspiration, mind, and mindfulness, which are collectively called the soul. The tangible object refers mainly to the body to which the soul is attached, such as a person's flesh. A person is a life because he has consciousness, thinking, spirit, and some invisible and impalpable psychological activities, as well as a soul-attached body, such as the five sense organs and the seven apertures in the human head, internal organs of body, trunk and limbs, skin and hair, nerve and blood, and so on. If a person is insensitive to burning when they put their hand into boiling water, to the pain of a thorn sticking into their skin, to the coldness of an ice house, to the flavors of food, to starvation when they have not eaten for too long, to danger, to love and hate, to changing surroundings, or to anxiety and fear, then they are without a soul. Such a person does not exist at all. Although a vegetative person is still a person medically speaking, their souls have left their body and roamed into a space tunnel. Because of the maladjustment of the body, their soul cannot attach to its flesh effectively and their thinking and consciousness cannot express themselves effectively. If we massage constantly at a certain acupoint of their body or call softly into their ears, we can bring their distant soul back. As the body changes and revives, the unconscious person becomes a normal person with life once again. Once a soul has left its body, that body will lose its vitality of life. As long as a soul stays within a body, that body will never die. Even if you remove a person's heart, drain all their blood, or even decapitate them, their life will still exist and they will not be dead. In the mythic novel, The Legend and the Hero, Prime Minister by Gon's heart was removed by Deji. He did not die right away because his consciousness, thinking, and psychosocial activity were still there. That is to say, his soul was still attached to his body so he could still walk and talk, but he breathed out his life immediately when he heard Deji, who disguised herself as a person selling vegetables, say, Vegetables without hearts can live but humans without hearts must die. Why? Because Deji's words sealed off his thinking and compelled his soul to leave his body. When the soul left the body, he was dead. An experiment was once conducted on a prisoner who was condemned to death. A guard explained, You have been sentenced to be executed immediately. You are to bleed to death, and we expect you to cooperate. They tied him onto a bed with his eyes covered, and leaving one arm hanging over the side above an empty bucket beneath it. Then, they pretended to cut his wrist with the dull side of a knife, meanwhile dripping water into the bucket beside the bed. The sound of dripping kept pounding in the prisoner's ears. Over tens of minutes, the continuous dripping noise waned gradually, leaving only the ambient room noise in the air. Then the sound of the dripping disappeared completely. With the disappearance of the dripping sound, he was found to be dead. What made the prisoner die? His wrist was not cut and none of his blood had been shed. What caused this death was conventional thinking. I was sentenced to death. My blood all left me. No one can live without blood. Ergo, I must be dead. As a result, death followed very soon. During China's SARS outbreak, the Sohu News Agency reported this story. In order to find out the source of the SARS virus, government agents went to Guangdong to investigate some restaurants and attached a tracking device to one of the animal traders. One time, this animal trader bought lots of snakes from a market to sell to a restaurant.
because they were very familiar with each other and the animal trader had nothing to do after his transaction was finished, he decided to help the cook to cut the snakes. As he was cleaning himself at the end, one of his fingers was caught by a snake's head. Although his life was not in danger after prompt medical attention, his finger that was bitten by the snake's head became disabled. We are not going to discuss the source of the SARS virus or the finger of the traitor, but our concern is how the dead snake could take revenge and bite the finger of the traitor after it had been dead for many hours. It could still take revenge after its body had stopped functioning because its consciousness and psychological activity still existed within its body. It had not died. This case proves that as long as a soul does not leave its body, even if its body is cut into pieces, its life will still be there. Buddhists Consecrate Tooth Relic of the Buddha People visiting ancestral graves like to burn incense, kowtow, which are regarded as performing conventional activities to express admiration and grief. Wise people understand that tooth relics of the Buddha are actually the whole body of the Buddha. As with a dressing room mirror that is broken into many pieces, you can still find your reflection in any of them. They burn incense and kowtow to their ancestors because they are afraid that their ancestors' souls might still be attached to their bodies and that if they stop respecting them, then they will feel guilty from bad consciences and will also be afraid of the spells that their ancestors might cast upon them, the ill retribution from them. A mystery of the Egyptian pyramids is that all those who have been involved with the ancient rulers' tombs, regardless of their methods or motives, as long as they dug the tomb of a pharaoh or disturbed the peace of one, would be punished, usually by sudden death. More than 40 archaeologists had died successively. The curator of the Cairo Museum died suddenly after being involved with an Egyptian burial mound and a mummy. Kamaroer achieved success by exploring Tutankhamun's tomb and then died of a rare but serious disease. Archaeologist Emery had examined ancient tombs until he became totally paralyzed and died suddenly. Professor Dormethrin entered the tomb to copy the inscriptions and also met a tragic death. Why did these things happen? Because the pharaoh's souls never left their bodies. Pharaohs believed that they would be brought back to life at the proper time. So they went nowhere and waited and guarded, day and night. If people dared to disturb them at any time, they would punish them. Once encountering a tomb whose soul has not left its body, most tomb robbers will suffer serious illness and die suddenly, while the rest might lose their families at least. Let us view some scenes in many movie stories. At the life and death fighting moment, although some people were killed obviously, they could struggle to fight at a crucial moment and killed their opponents and then died at the same moments. Why? The reason is the same as with the snake's head bite. Cancer, leukocythemia, AIDS, SARS, and other diseases kill people's thinking and consciousnesses first and then kill their bodies. People know that their likelihood of surviving from any of these incurable diseases is very slim once they contract them, so their consciousnesses collapse first. The collapse of their defense line will inevitably lead to overall weakness and a maladjustment of the body which in turn further strengthens their acceptance of death and only it awaits them in the end. Some wealthy people like to be examined regularly. They believe that if they diagnose a disease in its early stage while it is still curable, then they will be more able to survive it, but they do not appreciate the danger of this. If their examination report shows a healthy body, then everything is okay. Unfortunately, however, should an incurable disease be discovered, they could be digging their own grave. In fact, people's bodies have self-defenses with disease-fighting functions. Many diseases just come and go. They occur silently and disappear equally silently. Those who simply ignore them often go on with their lives without even knowing about them. But once they are discovered and taken seriously, they tangle their victims relentlessly till the end. There was a case at a Chinese hospital where two patients' examination reports were exchanged accidentally. Sadly, the one who was not too sick snuck into his doctor's office where the case reports were stored and found the wrong case report with his name on it. At the sight of his report, he felt dizzy and chilled instantly, struggled back to his ward, and totally collapsed because his examination report said terminal cancer. Meanwhile, the sister of the patient who actually did suffer from terminal cancer also snuck into the office to check her brother's condition. She was wild with joy when she saw that her brother's report said normal. 
She took it out happily and brought it to her brother. As soon as he read it, he could suddenly sit up and exclaimed, These doctors are jerks. They only want my money. Let's go home. He held his sister's hand and left the hospital cheerfully like a healthy man without even checking out. The Importance of Consciousness, Thinking, and Psychological Activities Souls are fundamental. They prove that the deaths of living creatures means the death of their souls first of all. The deaths of their fleshes are caused by the deaths of their consciousness, thinking, and psychological activities, which represent exactly their souls. People who die out of shame, fear, or anger are actually killed by their own souls. A shameless person never dies from shame. A courageous one never dies from fear, and a tolerant and broad-minded individual never dies from anger. Seth said, Physiological symptoms are communications from the inner self which indicate that we are making mental errors of one kind or another, and such is the case. When our consciousness, thinking, and psychological activities are functioning abnormally, our bodies become dysfunctional and maladjusted which is the reason why so many people need to self-refine. Taoists are second to none when it comes to talking about good health and long life. One who seeks Tao can most easily cast off their worldly involvements and treat their life from a higher level. When their self-refinement makes their consciousness, thinking, and psychological activities realize that as long as there is a soul, there is a life, then they are able to become celestial beings. Buddhists' understanding of life is at a higher realm because they understand that although souls consist of consciousness, thinking, spirit, and psychological activities, there cannot be a life without a physical carrier body, but they can attach themselves to other objects to form other new lives. Souls can go to the Elysium world directly and enjoy the supreme pleasure of life when self-refinement reaches a profound level by ridding themselves of the constraints of normal thinking completely. By supreme self-refinement, I mean self-refinement of consciousness and thinking. The self-refinement which aims towards supernatural power is at a lower level. Eminent Buddhist monks never take supernatural power seriously. However, many things grow in gardens that were never sown. Jesus and Sakyamuni considered how to save all living creatures. Yet in the end, both of them obtained supreme supernatural power. In postscript, I have written, unbearable cold, surpass the human world, infinite day on Balakia Island, scatter a handful of sand and thousands of trees will appear. The part that says, scatter a handful of sand and thousands of trees will appear, is a supernatural power, a magical power, yet it is never easy to obtain it. Journey to the West, herein called Journey, is regarded as a nonsense mythological novel by ordinary people. In fact, it really is not. Author Wu Qingyin was an eminent Dharma monk who came from India to China and faced the wall for nine years. In order to help people to understand Buddhist theory and Buddhist scriptures, and to relieve their souls from suffering, he promoted Dharma in the form of accessible stories by writing fictional accounts based upon profound Buddhist theory. Ordinary people may regard journey as mythological, but with Dharma eyes, it becomes very real. I used journey as an example of how, when you refine yourself to higher levels, you will understand the many meanings of life and the enormous functions of the mind to life. The whole story of Journey was to enlighten its readers, connoisseurs no knowledge, lay people like jollification. Sakya picked a flower and Kasapa smiled. Only by reaching a level of telepathy can you resonate with each other spiritually and smile. The monkey king in Journey traveled thousands of miles to pursue Tao. In the end, he arrived at Crescent Moon and Three Stars Cave in Jambudvipa, the celestial island's continent, sought Bodhi Patriarch as his master, and finally received the secret of longevity, learned the supernatural power of 72 different forms, and of mounting the clouds and riding the mist. The whole process is enlightenment to humans. It teaches us that if we want to sublimate the meaning of life, then we must cast off all our worldly ties. The birth of Monkey King from rocks tells us that it is only by disassociating from our families and affections in our conscious thinking and psychological activity and by ridding of all our constraints that we can gain the chance to advance to the supreme life space. If we merely consider being patriotic, upholding the honor of our ancestors and other worldly affairs, then we will stay at the same mortal level forever.
It informs us that once we determine to pursue Tao, we must overcome all hardships and be very persistent, just as Sakyamuni sitting under the Bodhi tree would not rise until he was enlightened. This is the only way. It enlightens us learn that no trees can bear ginseng fruit on the earth. Well then, where is the Wuzhuang temple? It is definitely not in the mortal world. In this sense, we must expand our view of thinking into the vast universe, surpass the limitations of space and time, and enter into another space to discover the mysteries of life in the distant heaven. Wu Kong's master wanted him to learn the knowledge of art, circulation, and movement. Wu Kong asked, Will this knowledge make me immortal? Master replied, No. And Wu Kong said over and over again, Then, I don't want to learn these three skills. This tells us that profound knowledge does not exist in these three types of knowledge, which are actually different levels of supernatural powers. If we restrict our thinking and consciousness to the level of art, we will never arrive at the other side of life. Wu Kong's refinement at Crescent Moon and Three Stars Cave was actually that he had uplifted himself with the knowledge of the soul, including thinking, consciousness, spirit, and psychological activities. When we grasp the secrets of soul and life, then 72 different forms, or even a thousand kind of transformations, are not difficult. It is not fanciful to mount the clouds and ride the mist, or rise to heaven and fall to earth. Speaking of mounting the clouds and riding the mist, people often regard this as a thinking fantasy and talking idiotic nonsense, but in fact when we let go of our consciousness and expand our thinking, then we will find that it is a very common life phenomenon in another space and time. Consider astronauts and spacecraft and consider the footprints left by those who flew to the moon, then suppose that the moon is smaller than its actual size. Half its size, one-third its size, down to a sphere as small as a football field. In these cases, could people have flown there? Or suppose the size of the Earth remains, but its weight is reduced to five metric tons. Could you then mount the clouds and ride the mist? Then, suppose that your weight is not 70 kilograms, but 20, 10, or 1 kilogram, or 1 gram, or even as light as a feather. Could you then mount the clouds and ride the mist? You should know that the spiritual entity, soul, which constructs life is weightless. Without a spiritual entity, soul, there is no life, but without material form, there is no life either. Life requires both. Life is one plus one is equal to one. Not one is equal to one and not zero plus one is equal to one. Spiritual entities can exist alone and material objects can exist alone. When spiritual entities and material objects exist separately, there is no life. It is only when the two are combined together that life generates. Just as with hydrogen and oxygen atoms, it is only when the two are combined together that water forms. Like cloud clusters with positive and negative charges, it is only when the two meet with each other that lightning and thunder will be generated. Souls can accomplish their functions only when they are attached to material objects. Souls can not only be attached to the bodies of humans and animals, but also to plants, rocks, houses, storms, rivers, ponds, cars, TVs, and any other things. There are lots of examples in the Bible. Many prophets have made incredible though obscure prophecies after having been possessed by spirits from supreme life space. Jesus cured many sick people who were possessed by evil spirits. There are countless records and instances of being possessed by souls or haunted by ghosts at all times and all throughout the world. Seth conveyed information of life to common people through an attachment to an American woman. There are many examples of souls becoming attached to lightning. Here are two examples. In 1899, a man was struck dead by lightning in his courtyard. Thirty years later, his son was killed in the same way and at the same place. On October 8, 1949, his grandson was struck dead by lightning in the same courtyard. Three generations were struck dead by lightning in the same place. These phenomena are clearly a spirit's revenge through the use of lightning. In 1918, a Canadian major, St. Mary May Ford, was struck by lightning. The same thing happened to him in 1924 and he became partially paralyzed, and again in 1930, and he became fully paralyzed. He died two years later, but his tomb was struck into pieces by lightning in June 1934.
An article compiled by Xiaoya is a perfect example of a soul attached to a car. The car was of a German make with six seats and it embodied excellent performance, luxury, and style, yet it earned the nickname of a killing monster because during its years on the road, it killed 18 people, injured seven others, and also led to the outbreak of the Great World War. The first incident occurred on June 28, 1914 when the Crown Prince of Austria and his princess were assassinated while inside of it. This became the spark that ignited the Great World War. The second time, it killed a queen and her friends riding in it. The third time, it killed Austria's 5th Division General Commander. The fourth time was the advisor to the general captain who not only smashed his head into the front, but also killed two farmers walking on the road. The fifth time was after the Great World War broke and another county's head of state inherited this car. He had four traffic accidents within four months, his backbone was broken, and he was permanently handicapped. The car was later owned or ridden by Dr. Kusakith, then a jeweler, a Swiss car racer, a farmer and his workers, as well as Tabor as a taxi, and his six friends, respectively. None of them escaped from this car's horrible karma. Finally, it was blasted into pieces by an Allied bomber during the Second World War and completely disappeared from the world without a single piece ever being recovered. Were these accidents or coincidences? I infer that the artisan who made this car was ill-treated and his soul had become attached to it so that he was able to foster a series of tragedies after his death to comfort his injured soul. We know that some wooden houses can make creaky sounds late at night. The reasons are not from thermal contraction or from wood breaking, but rather because the carpenters building them had been ill-treated and deprived of their due compensations. For this reason, they are angry and their souls often visit the houses to show their indignation after their deaths. Whenever there is unevenness, there will be sounds and shocks. All uprisings, rebellions, disasters, assassinations, and revolts throughout human history, even earthquakes, fires, and floods, are the results of indignated souls. There are plenty of cases of souls that have been attached to cars, boats, buildings, trees, flowers, and even grass. These are not difficult to find in historical records. In short, Life is one plus one is equal to one. Flesh without a spiritual entity is a corpse and we cannot regard a corpse as a life. In the same way, a spiritual entity without flesh is a soul and neither can we regard this invisible wave as life. Knowing what life is, we shall now discuss its origin. We have learned about the origin of the highest life in the universe, the greatest creator in time, space, and the universe. We have learned the origin of supreme space life and the origin of human beings from humanity and human life. Now let us consider the origin of tangible life on Earth. There are many ideas about the origins of life on Earth. Some are that it originated from lipid molecules, from RNA, from the proto-ocean, from Venus, from deep sea vents, from volcanoes on the Earth, from outer space, that comets with water hit the Earth which began it and still others say from earth slides or lightning or from any of numerous other suggestions. Most of these explanations listed above are reasonable because metaplastic lives, microorganisms and fungi, are generated from the land, oceans, deep sea vents, and volcanic zones, and not only in these special areas above, but also from soil air, the dead bodies of plants and animals, rivers, ponds, and rubbish heaps. Trillions of them form and die daily regardless of what the weather conditions are, and as long as the environmental conditions keep changing, new species will be generated. It can be said that the growth of populations, pollution of the environment, aggravation of the greenhouse effect, and the expansion of the hole in the ozonosphere will generate the new species, even in new bacteria expanding in large scales. Vast amounts of new bacteria may stop the ecology from worsening further, or they may lead to great disasters and plagues for humanity, perhaps much worse than even Europe's Black Death in the late Middle Ages. Unlike the SARS transmitting among humans, it may contaminate millions of people simultaneously. Besides metaplastic life, 
Hygrocolis life, can randomly generate from within the earth. As long as there is water, the molecular structure of soil will change and generate new life. Moss, lichen, and grasses are generated thusly. Let us focus on animals, insects, trees, and flowers, and see what the origins of these life forms are. Before we continue, please reread The Greatest Creator of Life Echanuan. It will be very difficult to understand the origin of life if you do not read this book first, for it is only when we recognize the greatest creator's position properly as the highest life in the universe that will we be able to clearly understand the origin of life. The universe did not start with a Big Bang. Today's galaxies and star systems are different from those of antiquity. Every heavenly body and galaxy in the universe has its own origin and function. As we know from fundamental physical knowledge, the total amount of energy in the universe is fixed and never varies, and perpetual motion machines are unreal. Inevitably, the motion of the moon, the earth, and the stars need to be powered by some force. But where does the primordial motive power come from? You might have a large pile of tiles, cement, and wood, but they cannot build a house without being designed and arranged by people, not to mention the intricacy of celestial bodies spinning around each other at high speeds. They could never construct star systems by themselves. Our solar system came into being four and a half billion years ago due to extended painstaking efforts of the greatest creator, gods, and celestial beings. The Earth was the first one formed in our solar system. Although astronomers believe that the history of the Sun is longer than that of the Earth, this does not mean that the Sun was the first body in the solar system. We all know that black holes populate the universe. Some scientists believe that black holes are magnetic vortices caused by the gravitation between two or more celestial bodies passing by each other just as with a typhoon and a tornado, but this cannot be true because black holes are aggregates of high-energy matter. The more energy they have, the less tangible they will be. Great form has no contour. We may compare black holes to batches of covered dough from which a cook has removed one piece according to his need for making a meal. The black hole is exactly that covered dough while the earth is that small piece which has been removed, and the greatest creator and his assistants, gods, are the cook who has removed the small piece. After the emergence of the earth, the sun was moved from somewhere. In order to make the earth rotate around the sun constantly, additional planets were added to the solar system. Therefore, the entire solar system exists to serve the earth. This means that humans exist on the earth, but they cannot exist on other planets of the solar system. After arranging the solar system, the gods sent down hundreds of millions of angels, super celestial beings, to terraform the earth. Water and the atmosphere were designed and created, and the combination of water, air, sunlight, and soil produced a large biomass of metaplastic microbes and hygrocolous grasses on the earth. Then the super celestial beings began to build pyramids. These were not the pyramids in Egypt, but ones that spread along the 30 degrees north latitude and 30 degrees south latitude in the ocean beds of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. They served as laboratories for developing life on Earth because they could gather effectively the special energy of the sun to speed up its growth and development. Super celestial beings designed and created most of the insects, all trees and flowers, and all herbivores on Earth today from within the pyramids and then transported these lives to every part of the Earth by advanced aircraft. The whole process lasted slightly more than a billion years. In the process of creating animals, celestial beings found that water needed to be brought inland for the plants and animals to spread across the earth. Therefore, they opened a mine to build a space station and constructed what we now see as the moon by using metals from the earth. With the moon, the earth became alive, not only bringing an ebb and flow, wind, clouds, snow, and rain, but also illuminating the night. After more than a billion years of creation, the earth morphed into a beautiful, rich, and prosperous paradise. It was a nearly perfect replica of the 10,000-year world. Super celestial beings, we can call them advanced intelligent people, were very pleased with the earth that they had made and did not want to leave it. But they had to do so in order to avoid the jealousy that was forming in other people. To protect their creation secrets, they dropped all the pyramids to the bottom of the oceans. 
the beautiful continent of Atlantis disappeared forever. As for the origins of other insects, carnivores, dinosaurs, and humans, please refer to humanity and human life of life Achanuan. We can conclude that apart from the lives of metaplasia and humidogene, all other species on Earth were designed and created separately rather than linearly by evolution, just as the tools that we use have been designed and created by people. Although unicycles, bicycles, carts, carriages, cars, and trucks share commonalities with each other, all were designed and created separately by humans. Carriages will always be carriages and can never transform into trucks. Snails will always be snails and can never evolve into farm cattle and monkeys will always be monkeys and can never evolve into humans.